Good day, everyone, and welcome. My name is Kayla Altman, and I am a Communities Coordinator at ASUG, and I am pleased to welcome you to today's webcast, Internet of Things, Transforming Your Business, SAP Partner Perspectives, and thank you for your participation today. I do have a few announcements as well as some housekeeping notes for you to please keep in mind. The first is a reminder that you can look for your personalized webcast listing each Monday. This newsletter is emailed out directly to you and is tailored to fit your preferences and individual membership needs. Using that publication, you'll be able to register for future events from the Internet of Things community, as well as other special interest groups that you are interested in. Today's webcast is being recorded. The recording, along with the slide deck, will be posted to our discussions area on ASUG.com. We will also email those links out directly to you. We do have a few events that are upcoming uh, this fall that we encourage you to join us at. The first is the ASUG SAP Analytics and Business Objects Conference, otherwise known as SABOC. Join us for three days in Austin, Texas for uh, deep dives and hands-on training for analytics and business objects. Co-located with that event is a three-day practical analytics workshop. This three-day hands-on analytics training course is perfect for business users. For more information, visit us on the website uh, posted on your screen. It is now with great pleasure that I turn this over to Paul Kirchina, the Community Advocate for Internet of Things, who will introduce both the webcast and our speakers for today. Thank you. Thank you, Kayla, and welcome everyone to Episode 7 of our 8-part um, ASUG IoT webcast series. Um, and uh, just a reminder, our last webcast in the series will happen uh, July 9th, um, so please uh, look, sign up uh, to participate in that one as well. Uh, so without further ado, um, I would like to um, introduce our first speaker. Actually, today is quite exciting because we actually have two partners um, in the SAP IoT space. Um, our first being Zebra Technologies, and it will be followed then by a presentation by Jasper as well. Um, both pr presentations I think you'll find to be um, quite informative. And I'd like to introduce you to our first speaker, um, Tom Biancoli. Um, from uh, Zebra Technologies. I'll turn it over to you, Tom. Hey, thank you very much, Paul, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining. I'm uh, Tom Biancoli, as Paul said, and the uh, Enterprise Technology Officer at uh, Zebra Technologies. It's my pleasure to speak with you today. Um, so just to start with um, setting some context around Internet of Things and, and uh, what I think is you know, really um, we're, we're on the edge of a, of a new era when it comes to computing, really. And uh, you know, I think Thomas Friedman, if you're familiar with his book, The World is Flat, the author Thomas Friedman said it well uh, in that the world is flat. If you just think back to, to 2005, I mean, just 10 years ago, Facebook didn't exist for, for most people on the planet, right? Um, Twitter was still a sound, 4G was a parking space, and Skype was a typo. So uh, we've just come a, a, a tremendous way uh, in a very short period of time. And I think um, you know, really the takeaway here is uh, the exponential pace at which uh, things are changing. Um, just, uh, just an incredible pace. Uh, if you look back at um, the amount of time it took television to reach an audience of 50 million users, it took 13 years. Uh, it took the Internet just five years to reach the same audience of 50 million users. And uh, it took Facebook only three years to reach an audience of 50 million users. And uh, for better or worse, it took Angry Birds 35 days to reach an audience of 50 million users. So uh, if, you, if you doubt that we're living in exponential times, um, I think you just have to look at that uh, 13 years to 5 years to 3 years to 35 days in the app world. Just a, a phenomenal pace and uh, rate of change uh, in the industry. And, and Internet of Things and the advent of that is going to be no different. Um, so you know, just taking a snapshot of where we are today, it's, uh, it's always good to, to zoom out a little bit. There are uh, 66 billion mobile phones uh, that will be around in 2020, uh, 30 billion smart connected devices. And uh, if you extrapolate that out a little bit, that last point around 42% um, of mobile bandwidth is going to be taken up by, by devices, which means by 2022-ish, uh, the machines, the uh, Internet of Things, as opposed to people, will be communicating more over the Internet than, uh, than humans will. And uh, you know, I find that in a, a lot of customers we speak to and uh, a lot of um, uh, planning we do from a future perspective is very much influenced by that. You know? And I think uh, the companies that are going to survive 
are asking themselves, what does the world look like? What does their competition look like? What are their, what's their customer engagement look like when uh, in just six or seven years from now, machines are going to be communicating more over the Internet than people? Uh, it's, it's, it's really pretty profound. And you know, as you can see in this chart, um, uh, the most exciting thing about all of this is that we're really just getting started. Uh, we are uh, at less than $4 billion if you subtract out the mobile phones, uh, connected, smart Internet of Things entities. And uh, over the next uh, five years, we're going to go to that 25 to 30 billion mark, and uh, that's seeing a, a Kager, a growth rate Kager of about 60% year on year of, uh, of connected things. So, a backdrop of, uh, of, of, of really exciting technology um, going from you know what's been bantied about for the last decade to to reality. You know. And you know, a lot of um, what you may be thinking, listening to, to what I'm saying, and I often hear when presenting on this is, well, the Internet of Things is interesting in the consumer space, right? If you think about Nest thermostats in your home, or you think about a Canary security system, or you maybe you even think about the Fitbit on your wrist. But how does the Internet of Things apply to business, and, and how is it really going to create change in business? And um, you, know, you, you can take a scan of this chart. I think the, the two important things I'd, I want to point out is, Nearly half of IoT uh, is is going to be focused on business devices and business use cases uh, in 2018. So in, in three short years, we're going to move from you know consumer applications of IoT getting the headlines to uh, these enterprise applications. Um, and and at the end of the day, the enterprise applications are the ones with the return on investments, right? They're not cool toys or interesting uh, hobbies. They're uh, about buy, uh, providing new levels of business productivity. And uh, you know, equally uh, stunning statistic I think is that you know businesses are going to invest a quarter of a trillion dollars in IoT by by the end of the decade. Um, and you know, we're hearing the same thing. I'll share in a few slides about what what we're hearing from the marketplace from various customer types. Uh, but if you scan the bottom of this slide, around four and five technology buyers uh, saying that IoT will be one of the most important initiatives for them over the next decade. And um, you know, that's up from. Uh, a ranking of six or seven just three years ago. So we're seeing this really bubble to the top of the list. We're seeing the VC investment um, community backing it up with uh, uh, VC investments in IoT startups um, increasing 10x over the last four years. So that's a rearview mirror look um, and is a leading edge indicator of, uh, of, of some of the uh, stats I, I shared about 2018 and, and by the end of the decade. So uh, truly exciting times. We're um, we're thinking that this is really going to um, uh, bring in, uh, usher in a, in a new age for enterprise opportunity and, and enterprise productivity. It's, it's, it's basically the next big change um, in enterprise since uh, the, uh, the, the advent of mobility, since, since the advent of the mobile device. So this new normal, uh, speaking of mobile devices, is that uh, everything's connected. Everyone is connected for sure now. Uh, and uh, that's uh, even starting to saturate, and uh, we're starting to see everything become connected uh, along the lines of these 30 billion devices by 2020. Um, kind of an interesting picture, if you haven't seen that on the right of this slide, that's a picture of the Vatican in 2005 uh, when Pope Benedict stepped down, and uh, a picture in 2013 of when Pope Francis took the uh, papacy, and um, I, I think if you could see the picture, uh, clearly on your screen, there's not much to say. You just just look at it, and you see you go from a, a sea of people to a sea of devices <laughs> in the, in the 2013 picture. So uh, the idea that everybody's connected, everybody has the bandwidth, they can publish video photos on the spot, uh, as is being shown in that 2013 picture, is um, you know is really is really come of age. Um, looking forward. Uh, What's, what's quite compelling off of the connection between analytics applications and this notion of Internet of Things is uh, Accenture uh, actually uh, anticipates that by 2017 more than 50% of analytics applications or implementations are going to come from real-time event streams, real-time data, You know whether it's coming from people, it's coming from assets, it's coming from machines, it's coming from devices. Um, essentially, it's going to come from the instrumented world and um, that's going to change uh, the way operations run. Um, you know, discussions that that we're having with uh, with customers and with industry is that you know the very notion of planning in, and scheduling and uh, route optimization ahead of time is really just going away. So the, the, the notion of a 
of a schedule is, is starting to disintegrate right. because as this real-time information is available, um, schedules are no longer planned or scheduled, right? They're, they're dynamically created, and that information is just being pushed out to the right user at the right time for them to take action in the right way. So fundamentally changing the way workflow operates and operations operate um, you know, across pretty much every vertical we serve, which includes uh, retail and transportation, manufacturing, and, and healthcare, as well as others. So I've mentioned a few times uh, about this era of computing, and um, you know, it's, it's easy to get caught up on, on hype and to, to think that this is going to really change, but um, you know, is there really evidence that it's happening? And um, I think this is a great way of viewing the ages of computing, the epics that have transpired in the past around mainframe computing, personal computing, network computing, and now what Forrester is calling smart computing. Uh, IBM will refer to this as cognitive computing, but it's, it's this next age of uh, fusing data with cloud uh, computing power to generate smart and aware systems. Um, systems of um, systems of intelligence, as as many are starting to call it. So, uh, going from systems of record uh, in 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 the uh, in late 80s, early 90s, think ERP type systems, to systems of engagement, um, think uh, you know late 90s, early 2000s around uh, uh, mobility coming on, on the scene. Now to systems of intelligence, which is that um, you know, once my environment, my people, my assets are fully instrumented and I can connect that up to cloud computing power, uh, there's no stopping uh, uh, really what's possible. So uh, what this chart really shows is a couple of things. One is that um, these uh, ages of computing come around roughly every 18 years, right? So these are uh, once or twice, uh, maybe one and a half time in a, in a career will you see something like this. Uh, and, and so, you know, for me, you know, me, me personally, and I think for, for most of us on the, on the call here, it's uh, ex extremely exciting. Um, mainframe computing, you know, in the, in the 60s, uh, basically the first half of that, you know, 16, 17, 18-year period from 1959 to 1976, the first half of it was, um, you know, at relatively rapid growth as it, it came on the scene. 7.8% uh, you can see in uh, change in, in U.S. INT investment relative to GDP on a CAGR basis over that, you know, the first half of that 16 or 17 year period. And then when personal computing, and then, and then it flattens out, right? The back half of that period is relatively flat uh, change in IT investment relative to GDP. And then when personal computing came on the scene, same sort of phenomenon, 8.6% growth rate over the first half of its lifespan, and then a flattening out over the back half. And same with network computing. And now, um, you know, that Forrester had called around 2008, 2009, the beginning of this smart computing effort uh, or smart computing paradigm, um, speaking with IBM, they'll call it at closer to 2011-ish. Um, so if, you have, you know, if history is an indicator, which uh, usually is, not always, but usually, then from 2011 to about 2019-20, which would be the first half of, a, of an 18-year period, would be uh, the area of, or the time of fastest growth uh, within this new age of computing. So uh, we're, we're right here. We're right on it. Uh, we're seeing lots of uh, indicators that point that it's happening. Uh, lots of companies are trying to figure out what it means. And hopefully I can share uh, a few examples of where we're seeing it take root and, and, and maybe some um, uh, notions of where it can eventually go to. So, so with that as backdrop, um, hopefully helpful and informative, the question really becomes what, what does it really all mean and, and what does it mean to us? And, and the way that we've described this, um, you know, not just for, for our organization, but, you know, for the in industry in general, is around uh, three major themes of sensing information uh, at the edge of the network, analyzing that information uh, to derive insight, and then ultimately uh, pushing that uh, information out to the edge to the right user who can take action um, to, to really optimize um, workflow, essentially, reduce errors, et cetera. So, you know, in this, this diagram, you, you see that, uh, capturing information at the edge of the network where, where work is happening. In this case, um, the, the, uh, the image there is, is that of a, uh, it's a 3D depth map of a loader, a worker loading a vehicle with packages um, in, in a uh, shipping environment. Uh, being able to capture information automatically about the 
uh, efficiency, productivity, uh, volumetric efficiency of the trailer as they're loading that trailer with goods, uh, sending that information that's being uh, collected at the edge of that network around that about that trailer back for analysis, and then ultimately being able to push out the exception processing or the action that someone should take in order to uh, to make that next best move, as we say, or that next best action uh, to optimize the way the uh, the operations are running. So th these are solutions that, um, that the one I just described we're, we're actually looking at and piloting. Um, it is, um, it is uh, if you've heard the term of uh, quantified self, which is the notion of um, wearing a, a Fitbit or a health monitor on, on you as an individual and capturing that information about your behaviors and your habits so that you can take better actions and, in, and improve your health. Uh, I, I, my my affectionate uh, name for this is Fitbit for the Enterprise, really, in some ways, which is capturing information about the health of the enterprise overall, not necessarily about an individual, and then being able to analyze and mobilize that health so people can take better actions. Uh, so in, in this scenario, we're essentially replacing what's been the mainstay of uh, shipping and dock operation management, which is which is a dock walk. And in a dock walk, a dock manager will, will go visit 50 dock doors and walk around that facility. In all reality, that dock manager is hoping that he or she, you know, runs into a problem or bumps into a problem that they can fix. Um, there's no guarantee that they'll wander or walk into the right place at the right time to be able to, to identify those issues in real time. And that's sort of best in class. It hasn't largely changed in decades. And with solutions like this, in the palm of a dock manager's hands, they can virtually walk the dock. They can see what the productivity is at every dock door at every moment in time, and then they can proactively address uh, those areas of the of the operations of the facility that needs uh, you know addressing, rather than um, than, than basing it on hope uh, via dock walk. So, uh, hopefully, that gives a, a little bit of color around what we mean with regard to to sense, analyze, and act, and. Um, you know, much like enterprise mobility was about devices, this new era is going to be about data and, and not just the devices. Um, you know, uh, always like to stay grounded in what others are saying and what the outside world is doing, and so um, uh, protected the uh, the innocent here with uh, with removing uh, you know specific customer names and and uh, people saying these things. But you know, if you listen to, to what's going on out there across T&L and retail, as examples on this, this slide, you can read some of these for yourself. But, you know, a couple I'll point out, um, particularly in the retail environment, is, um, you know, the, the advent of mobility has been tremendously impactful to, to retailers. Um, and, uh, you know, it's a relatively new concept of order online and pick up in store. Uh, and, and no sooner have retailers kind of ironed out that process and, and been able to make it work uh, that we have, if you look at the quote on the bottom right of this slide, uh, we have uh, customers and companies talking to us about uh, the impact of mobile shopping. So now there's a, a, a trend of using my mobile device to order online and pick up in store. But now that I'm ordering from a mobile device, I might be at the coffee shop down the road and order something online for pick up in store finish my coffee and 10 minutes later be at that physical store and expect to be able to pick up my order. So it's not good enough for the retailer to to pick that order and put it to the side in hours or days. They've got to do it literally in minutes. So um, they are looking at solutions to be able to go from that order is placed online, route that pick for that customer's order right down to a store associate that's on the floor of the store that that item's going to be picked up from within seconds of which when the, that order was placed online and then have that uh, be, that that order picking be able to be fulfilled within minutes. And so uh, this is driving an increase of devices in people's hands uh, inside the store environment. It's driving an increase in connectivity of those devices to in-store networks, and it's really driving um, you know the promise of omnichannel that's been talked about for a long time, which is connecting e-commerce e platforms to the brick-and-mortar legacy platforms. and and building this bridge between physical and digital. And uh, there's just so many examples of that. If you look at the other one to the left of, of, the, uh, of, the, of the slide on the bottom around uh, tracking consumers in the store and being able to see where traffic is flowing in real time and be able to make dynamic uh, workforce decisions. Uh, these are all areas that, um, you know, they're not outliers. They're, they're things we're hearing really consistently, and uh, I'm sure many of you are hearing the same things. 
So just to click down on retail a little bit, because I, I think it's one of the more compelling areas right now, just given the the disruption of uh, e-commerce platforms, uh, the ability to order online, and in some cases have items shipped to your front door within an hour. Uh, if you look at what uh, Amazon is doing, for instance, in, in several um, uh, metropolitan areas. Uh, so what are the, 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 the real changes or the, the drivers behind revolution in retail? Um, it's this notion that I described earlier of, of shopping anywhere. So it's not just when I'm in front of a desktop computer, which was the case maybe four or five years ago, but it's shopping as I go, um, adding items to my basket, having the expectation that um, I can check out at any time, pick those items up in store. And uh, as you can see from some of the statistics there on shopping anywhere, it's, it's just accelerating at a tremendous pace. Uh, getting personal, you know, for those retailers that are going to survive, it's all about personalization um, and, and harvesting you know, big data that's been collected about people's shopping behaviors, about inventory information in real time, being able to sync those two things together. And when that's done effectively, um, those retailers who can do it best can enjoy a 60% increase in margin, which, um, you know, in a grocery retailer that has, you know, two and a half points of margin, uh, 60% is the difference between, you know, being a, a genius uh, retailer in terms of gross margins and, uh, and and potentially going out of business. So extreme pressures there. Uh, this notion of a digital world, if you will, or the combination of f physical and digital coming together. Uh, I think the best way to sum that up is to, to, to talk to it as online analytics for the offline world. And, and what we mean by that is when you're on an online e-commerce site, that e-tailer has – uh, a view into everything that you do while you're you're shopping. You know, did you put something in your online basket? Did you remove it from that basket? What website did you come from when you went to their website? Did you abandon your your e-cart uh, because you decided to do some research or look at something else from a competitor? Um, uh, what items have you looked at recently? What kinds of things have other people in your demographic purchased? These are all analytics that an online e-tailer has at the at their fingertips just by the very fact that you're shopping on their website. Uh, you transition over to the physical store, the brick-and-mortar store, and none of this information is visible to, to retailers. So uh, any one of us can walk into a retailer, uh, competitively shop for an electronics item on, on, on a website uh, inside their store, uh, even purchase from a competitor inside their store and showroom, use their store as a showroom for trying devices, walk out of the store, and, and the store doesn't even know that we, we came in and, and they didn't even get the opportunity to engage us. Same thing with abandoned baskets or not being able to find what you're looking for in the store. Um, none of that analytics information is available to the physical uh, retailer until just very recently. So I'll give some examples of, uh, of how that's happening. And I think that is one of the, the better examples of Internet of Things uh, penetrating the front end of retail to turn that brick and mortar retailer into uh, having the same level of insight as their online counterparts. Integrated supply chain, um, you know, supply chain is just collapsing. Uh, what I mentioned earlier uh, around the idea of uh, being able to order online and have it shipped to your home within one hour, uh, that doesn't happen unless the store itself actually becomes a node on the supply chain. So. We're actually seeing fulfillment not just happen from warehouse, but fulfillment of goods happen from the store. And uh, if we're going to use the store as a, as a retailer and as a warehouse at the same time, then inventory accuracies need to be much, much better than they are in aggregate within a retail environment. And that requires um, you know, just fundamental changes in, in, in the way that uh, inventory is calculated and the way the environment's instrumented to be able to gather that inventory information. So lots of interesting things going on there. Uh, it's a bit early on that one, but I would say stay tuned over the next couple of years. We're going to see um, you know, lots of what we uh, term as smart infrastructure. And uh, that's thinking about infrastructure inside the retail environment is not just a, a wireless LAN network, but as a, a suite of sensors that can detect what's happening in the environment, uh, even down to, to the inventory level as an example. So the uh, slide you're looking at now is, you know, again, just to, to make it real, um, starting on the left-hand side, let's just look at a shopping journey as an example. So I, as a shopper, walk into a store with my mobile device, and via the Wi-Fi network inside the store, I'm greeted, I'm enabled, and I'm onboarded onto the retailer's portal. Um, and in that portal or that web page that uh, I'm onboarded onto, I'm provided with a set of services that I can leverage inside the store, for instance, price checking via my mobile phone, 
so my phone becomes a mobile kiosk inside that store environment. It's personalized to that store environment because it's on the, the network of that particular store. Um, I'm empowered to be able to request help, perhaps for my device, or be able to push to, push to talk to a, a store associate or an expert in the store um, via my handheld, uh, via my, my own uh, consumer device as, as the shopper. But I'm also understood in the sense that, um, back to the notion of personalization, am I a customer that likes to be approached with help from a store associate? Am I, um, I don't want to interact with people, but I want to interact with technology. Or am I the kind of individual that doesn't want to interact with any technology, I only want to interact with people. So really understanding who is in your store and how to present and posture your sales associates to that individual uh, becomes enabled through these kinds of solutions and, um, and getting to identify and understand and know your customer better. Uh, connected and aware. Uh, the, the notion here of not just um, uh, providing this information and this visibility uh, and capability to the shopper, but enabling store associates to be much to, to much more effectively interface with that shopper. Um, let's face it, most of us, uh, when we go shopping into a physical store, we often know more about the goods we're shopping for and the reviews online before we walk into the physical store than many store associates actually do. So the more that uh, uh, retailers can arm their their sales associates with information uh, that provides personalization, that lets them know how they should engage that particular shopper, uh, that's able to pull up their preferences or previous orders, uh, the better chance that sales associate has of intelligently engaging the shopper and, and converting them to, uh, to a sale. So these kinds of solutions uh, are, are being deployed today. Uh, the example um, I'm highlighting on this slide is, uh, is a public one uh, that uh, Wanda Mall Group in uh, Asia uh, has actually deployed a um, combination of Wi-Fi and micro-locationing beaconing solutions that does precisely what I described on the, on the previous slide, which is it onboards the mobile phone to the mall uh, Wi-Fi. It provides guest or shopper services, such as which stores are located, you know, basically a mapping of, of where stores are located within the mall. Uh, it provides the leasee of the retail establishments within that mall, um, uh, foot traffic and uh, dwell time information about, you know, basically heat mapping that real estate to show where the hotspots are in terms of uh, customer traffic. And the really interesting thing about this is that, you know, it's increased um, uh, retailer revenues within uh, the mall environment, it's increased customer satisfaction because of the empowerment the shopper has uh, with the device and the experience they can enjoy. But I think a, a really interesting side effect of this whole thing is that it allowed the mall operator to optimize their uh, rent uh, for the various retail establishments based on being able to show where the, the hottest spots or the, the most uh, heavy traffic to, uh, trafficked areas are within the, the mall environment. So, um, that, so this data was actually leveraged to dynamically set uh, lease or rental prices to the retailer's renting space within the mall environment. So it's, it's actually, in, this, in that case, you know, creating or enabling entirely new business models, which is, um, actually was an unintended side effect. Um, so transitioning you know, out of the store and kind of going down the rest of the supply chain, uh, we're seeing that these... Uh, vertical-based silos of Internet of Things are really starting to converge on each other. So it's not just about the store collecting data or the transportation logistics provider collecting data about how their, their operations are working or even the, the manufacturer or the um, you know, meatpacking plant or the processor uh, of food, in this case shown on this slide, uh, is obviously has a set of data they're collecting about their environment. It's about stitching all this data together into um, uh, a seamless view of what's happening across the whole supply chain, literally from farm to fork. Um, so with that, um, let's just see where we are here. Yeah, so, so just a lead into um, some of what we're thinking here before we, we run a, a brief video uh, that, that highlights um, how this can all come alive. So the notion of smart objects in this example is the idea of a, uh, a, a battery-powered tag that um, 
can collect information about the state of the goods that it's uh, attached to. And you could think about uh, things like temperature and humidity and shock and vibration. And then it's able to transmit uh, that small amount of data, because it's, it's relatively uh, small payload, up to a wireless LAN network for collection. So without um, worker or human intervention and having to manually uh, interrogate various sensors, the um, wireless LAN, the already deployed wireless LAN infrastructure that's in so many environments, whether it's in retailers or it's in uh, transportation and uh, logistics hubs or warehouses, or in an increasing way, we're starting to see it actually go mobile. So the, the mobile devices we're carrying are functioning both as clients and as access points, and, and so they're able to collect this information as well. Uh, so this notion of a flexible, low-profile battery power tag that can sense information and then take that sensed information and, and, as shown in this graphic, be able to highlight an exception. Uh, in this case, we're, we're doing temperature monitoring, um, and uh, unless there is an issue, nothing's being reported, but if a if a certain trip point is reached, then that can generate an exception for someone to take action. And um, as we get the, uh, Kayla, if you could get the, uh, the video queued up and we can get that rolling, um, I'll just mention that uh, the United Nations uh, World Health and Food uh, Administration has estimated that about one-third of the world's food perishes in transit, uh, which is a... Uh, staggering statistic, but um, it, it's really a reality. So as we're seeing increased mandates and legislation for, for providing better pedigree of food as it moves through the, uh, the supply chain, we're going to see uh, an increase in solutions like the one we're going to show in the video. The Internet of Things is changing the future of cold chain. We live in a world with billions of Internet-aware devices, systems, applications, and services. The Internet of Things will enable process and operational efficiency, real-time visibility, and new experiences. Everything is about experiences. From knowing what farm your chicken came from to the freshness of the salmon on your plate. With Sitar, Zebra's Internet of Things platform, and a range of enterprise-grade devices from our portfolio, the future is possible. Let's give you a little insight into what Zebra knows about the future of cold chain. Powerful applications that sense, analyze, and act based on real-time enterprise intelligence. Smart labels in the future will capture the condition, location, and movement of packages, allowing them to update their Zatar avatar through various Zebra enterprise-grade products, such as our wireless access points or using our mobile computers as communication gateways. As the Zatar platform is updated with real-time information from all of these tags, it provides notifications and alerts right at the point of activity, such as package movement, fallovers and drop in refrigeration temperature, and by automating receiving and order history tracking. Previous manual tasks can now be automated and new insights can be discovered, enabling customers to enjoy their salmon knowing exactly how it got onto their plate. Zebra knows the Internet of Things. Zebra knows visibility. Zebra knows location. Zebra knows condition. And Zebra knows customer experience. Do you want to know where the world is going? Follow a trusted partner that can work with you to create applications that monitor, analyze, and act on real-time enterprise intelligence. Okay, great. Hopefully everyone is able to see that. I couldn't see the, the video uh, live moving, but um, it, uh, it basically went through an example of a smart tag uh, tracking through the supply chain. So what I really want to conclude on here is, uh, is something that you know, perhaps is not obvious, which is as Internet of Things takes hold, uh, the experience is fundamentally shifting for users uh, inside the work environment. And uh, what I mean by that is that uh, we're going to see a, a shift and a big uptake in wearable computing as environments become smarter. And, and why that uh, ends up being the case is because as we sense this information at the edge of the network, 
analyze that data, we have the opportunity to present that next best action. So we're in a very unique position to fundamentally change the user interface and user experience. What we're all used to on our conventional mobile devices is uh, pulling data from that device, right? querying that device and, and pulling data from it. As we go to smarter environments, we're going to come into a, a, a mobile experience, particularly in the enterprise, that's going to be much more push-oriented. And uh, that is the perfect sort of environment for a wearable heads-up display where I can see, see my physical world, but over that physical world, I can overlay information that's being pushed down to me based on uh, exceptions and, uh, and what's happening around me and in my environment. Uh, and so uh, as this advances, we're going to go from uh, wearable computing as it exists today, which is, I think most of our experience is largely around uh, strapping a mobile computer to, to a person. <laughs> it's not the most elegant to what we call future two here in the middle of this slide, which is you know, guided infrastructure, being able to present that right information to the person for them to be able to take the next action, that kind of push scenario that I described earlier. And then ultimately it goes to autonomous, which is that the endpoint that we're pushing information to may not actually end up really being a human. It uh, may, may end up being a, an autonomous uh, entity, such as a robot. And we're starting to see trials there. Uh, you may have seen uh, some of the acquisitions Google's done over the last five years, which has acquired eight to ten robotics companies um, in, a, in, a, in a whole host of spaces. So um, this drives what we're calling tomorrow's hands-free, frictionless workflow. So my hands are free. My head is uh, up for operation. I'm simply doing my job, and the data is being collected uh, automatically without me overtly having to do anything. And the right next move for me to take, whether it's a sortation application, it's a picking application, it's a planogram compliance application, it's uh, deciding which um, you know, package of food should be recalled, uh, all of that information can be seamlessly presented in front of me uh, based on the combination of this wearable computing type platforms with uh, smarter infrastructures and Internet of Things based environments. So uh, in conclusion, um, as much as uh, the last uh, frontiers and uh, paradigms have been around transitioning through ages of physical computing, uh, going from mainframe to desktop to mobile, uh, we're entering this new age of data-based computing, where insight can be derived from data to enable better outcomes to occur in real time. Uh, thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Tom.